Your next session is how to wear your password, and your speaker is Michael. Uh, sorry, Marcus Jacobson. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. So, hi everybody, and uh, thanks for coming. I wanted to start by asking you to please feel free to interrupt me at any point uh, to ask questions or to tell me to move on if uh, if you think I'm spending my time on things that you'd rather not hear about. So, I'm going to talk about um, a password. Um, replacement approach. And um, passwords, of course, um, it's, it's a dreadful thing. Uh, about 10 years ago, Bill Gates famously um, predicted that they will soon be dead. Uh, they aren't soon dead. Uh, they're alive and kicking and much to uh, lots of consumers' woes. Because there's an increasing number of sites where a password is needed. And of course, it's a burden. It's a mental burden for people to have to remember these passwords and manage all of them. And um, as a result of that, one thing that happens is that people reuse passwords, which of course is a security problem. Another security problem that has escalated over the last 10 years is the uh, increase in computational power. What used to be secure just isn't secure these days. And instead of users being more able to um, figure out how to manage their security and have strong passwords, I would say that they're less able to simply because there are more things to manage and things are more stressful and therefore the human brain doesn't grow. Um, security is decreasing and the pain is increasing. Something has to, to change. Now, one approach uh, that people often argue in this context is password managers. And I used to work at a large financial service provider um, that resolutely refused to uh, promote password managers for the simple reason that they would become a one-stop shopping portal for malware authors. If everybody uses um, password managers, and these are software password managers, it's really making security worse because of malware. So the, the obvious, seemingly obvious uh, solution to this, to use password managers, just is not going to work, not in its current way. So. NIST estimates that uh, passwords have 19 bits of security. Um, at first sight, that might make us think that they have 19 bits of security, but that's a mistake to think. Uh, people who equate entropy with security, they make a mistake. The entropy is kind of like an upper bound of the security, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Another thing is that entropy, of course, is an average measure. It doesn't say anything about your security, nor the distribution of security for different passwords. If you really want to know the uh, distribution for password security, you have to look at passwords. I did this a few years ago. I had access to um, hundreds of thousands of passwords that had been stolen uh, by criminals, and then uh, their drop boxes had been raided by people I knew, and so I got these passwords um, for various sources. And I analyzed them, and I looked at just how strong are passwords. This is an important thing to understand. Also, I did it for another reason, too. I wanted to build password strength checkers that were better than today's password strength checkers, which, in my view, leave a lot to be wished for. So anyway, I found a couple of interesting things when I looked at passwords. One, one interesting thing is that, actually, teenagers have stronger passwords than adults. One reason might be that they have fewer passwords to, ma passwords to manage, and therefore it's easier for them to put their mental effort in, into a small number of them. Another possibility might be, and I don't know which one is the real reason, you know, they grew up in an era where security was something that you were taught and people minded security, and so they kind of got the right security upbringing. And, and if that is true, then maybe things will get a little bit better. But I don't think it will outpace the speed of computation. Increasing. Another thing that you realize when you look at lots of passwords is that the distribution is pretty ugly. There is a large number of passwords that have about 10 bits of security. And, um, and they pass password uh, strength checkers perfectly well. So, so that's bad news, right? So about 10 bits of security is what, of course, you would expect from pins. Now, pins have exactly the same kind of problem as passwords do. They don't have a uniform strength or uniform distribution or anything. In fact, there are lots of people who have 
2580, that's just a straight line down on your pen pad. That's a very common one. If you do the same exercise as I mentioned for password uh, and look at lots of them for pins, you'll see that the distribution is very uneven. Another thing people do is that, um, well, since pins are kind of hard to remember, but everybody ought to remember their spouse's birthday, well, that's an easy one. They pick their spouse's birthday, at least one number that they can remember. They think, well, I shouldn't pick my own birthday because people might know that, but my spouse's birthday, that's, they don't even know my spouse, these people, right? But hey, how many days in the year are there? Uh, 365 opp opportunities here. And if your spouse uses Skype and Skype asks for your spouse's birthday so that Skype can send uh, congratulate this person a message to everybody who have befriended your spouse, well, your, your pin has been revealed. That sucks. So, and this is an example of why the entropy is not equal to the security. Because of all these, call it side channel attacks, the actual security is way lower than the entropy. Now, a third alternative to pins and passwords, of course, is biometrics. People say that fingerprints have about 20 bits of entropy. Of course, again, now I want to say that this does not mean that they have 20 bits of security. The false positives is not one in two to the 20. And the false positive, I argue, that is, sorry, the false positive, I argue, is that's how you measure the security. That's the risk that somebody else gets access to your account. Now, a related note is the false negatives. That's the risk that you will not get access to your account. That is primarily a usability problem. If you enter your password and you enter it incorrectly because you, because you fat finger the keyboard, it's particularly easy on a phone, well, you don't have access now and you have to try again. That's a painful thing. If you've forgotten the password, you need to rely on a reset mechanism. And that is both painful and actually also potential security liability. The mere existence of the password reset is a security liability, that is. So, and it's the same problem, of course, for pins, that false negatives pose a problem. And false po negatives in terms of biometrics, that just means that you have to try again. You have to scan it again. Now, my wife is what's not so flatteringly called a goat. Uh, don't get me wrong. A goat is a person with very um, bad fingerprints. When she did her uh, immigration, uh, they had to fly in a special fingerprint reader in order for her fingerprints to be read. Uh, she likes to think of herself not as a goat, as a per but rather as a person with very smooth skin. So if she were in the audience, of course, I would have presented the problem in a diff slightly different way. But the fact remains that about 3% of the population, I believe, are what I would refer to as goats. And, and that makes those people have to take special measures in order to address uh, the problem of false negatives. Another usability issue comes from the effort. Say that you're going to enter a password on a smartphone. That's a little bit of a struggle. Say instead that you have to enter it on a smartwatch, like this one. Now, that's, that's a real struggle. I, I would say I would not do it in order to buy a coffee. I might do it in order to buy a car, right? It's a struggle. You could think of the quality of the authentication method as a measure of how willing are people to authenticate for some task. If I'm willing to authenticate in order to buy a chewing gum or see a website, it's a good authentication method. If I have to be motivated by not only that it's a car that I'm buying, but it's a cool car, it's too hard to authenticate. So you want security, low false positives. You want usability, the low false negatives, and you want it to be as effortless as possible. Now one way of dealing with the effort thing is to say, you don't do it per transaction, but you do it 
once per day or once per month, or, and then you're being covered. So assume a device, a smartwatch, a bracelet, something like that, and as you're putting it on, as you're physically tethering it to yourself, you're also logically tethering it to yourself. It becomes you, it represents you. Let me show you what I mean. So this lock represents uh, a smart clasp. The smart clasp is this thing, the clasp on the watch. And the only thing that is smart about it is that it knows when it's open and it knows when it's closed. Say that I have a watch or a bracelet in my drawer and in the morning I put it on. Now that means that as I'm closing the clasp it knows it's being closed. It wants an identity now. So it wants to acquire an identity of me or whoever else is wearing it so that it can represent me. One way or another I authenticate to the smart clasp or to an associated processor. If it's a watch, it's the watch's processor, of course. And now this watch or this clasp carries my identity for the duration until I open it again. And during this duration, it will act as, you might think, as a password manager. It will represent me. So I don't have to enter passwords or I don't have to enter keys or I don't have to do anything other than somehow indicate that this is a transaction that I want to carry out. And then when I, of course, when I take off the watch at night or when I take a shower or go through airport security maybe, you want it to unbind the identity. So that if I take it off and you quickly put it on, well, it's not my identity it's carrying anymore. Again, it's going to say, I want an identity. And if you can't provide it with your identity, well, it will remain identityless. So this does not replace existing technologies. In fact, I would say it leverages them. So first of all, when it's asking for an identity, when it wants to acquire an identity, how do you do that? Well, if you think of it as a clasp only. This clasp might have a biometric fingerprint reader, for example, you put your finger on there. Kind of expensive to have a biometric reader, but yeah, you could. Another thing, it might have a microphone, you speak to it. Either it analyzes your voice, or it analyzes a credential that you're speaking. Um, if you want to know more about how one could do that, there's a reference in the white paper, uh, which at the beginning of the talk, we heard that it's on a disk or something. You'll find it. Or send me a note and I'll send you a copy. So anyway, you could have a credential that is spoken and you speak it to the clasp. Another possibility is that you could use a PIN or a password. But wait a minute, you're saying, how, how could you? There's no keyboard here. Well, it's so easy to leverage a proxy device. You've got a phone. Your clasp wakes up your phone, says it's time to authenticate. Now there's also a chance to use a biometric reader. You could use a biometric reader on your phone, verifies your identity, tells the clasp that it's you. Or you could input a PIN or a password, and whether it's verified on your phone or on the clasp, it doesn't matter. The clasp learns it's you. So the clasp, as you're putting it on, as you're closing it, acquires an identity, whether directly from a sensor or from another device that you've paired with it, like your phone. And then it becomes you until you take it off. Now that doesn't solve the entire problem, of course. That only solves the problem of whom it should represent, not when it should represent you. And another thing I haven't mentioned, of course, is when the device is going to represent you. How would it do that? Well, one approach would be as a simple password manager. It would be considered less risky by, for example, financial service providers if it isn't all in software and on your PC. But it's on a device where you're not so likely to install things, you're not so likely to get malware, and it might be protected by something like Trust Zone. Another approach that is, in my view, better is to use what's called FIDO. The, it's a biometric and authentication standard that is um, breaking through now. Um, and, and so you could instruct using the smart clasp a FIDO entity on your device to represent you to websites, to doors, 
to whatever entity wishes to know that it's you. Now the question is, you're in line at Starbucks, I'm in line at Starbucks. We both have one of these uh, devices. Who's going to pay for your drink? Is it you or is it me? So there are company like Square that have decided that in order to address this, the device that the person uses to pay with is going to somehow convey an image to the clerk who at checkout is going to match it to the person and make sure that the right person is paying. Now that has a lot of manual effort involved and also risk. There's the risk that two people look somewhat similar to the clerk and then it falls. You want it to somehow determine the user intent automatically. So I'll briefly describe three ways. Uh, one which I refer to as a proximity, one as uh, implicit determination of intent, and one explicit. So an example of the first one is that you're going through a subway turnstile. You're going to pay merely by being there. You're passing through this area, therefore you pay. There's no doubt about it. It doesn't matter whether it's you or it's me going through. If we're both going through, we're both going to pay. So another one is that you're coming to a website and you want to pay for something. Clicking. That's a simple way of, for you to say what you're going to pay for. An implicit way of authenticating you is therefore built into the fact that you're clicking. At the very moment you're clicking, you're also conveying your intent. And I'll tell you soon how to do that. And a more explicit thing, way of determining that you have intent to pay or to authenticate in general is to have you sign. For example, as you're coming up to the terminal in the grocery store, you're signing for something. We could use that. So let me tell you a little bit about how. So in the case where you're buying something on a website or you're logging in, say that you're using your phone or a tablet. This device, of course, knows when somebody clicked on it. It can record the timing of it. At the same time, your smart clasp or bracelet can record the accelerometer trace, right? You're clicking on something. These two can be compared. So your phone or your tablet will send to the paired smart clasp or associated device information about the timing. The uh, identity manager associated with the smart clasp then will look at the accelerometer trace and compare it to this timing and say, was it this person who clicked here? If it was, then yes, approve it. This is the person who wants to log in, this is the person who wants to buy something. You go up to a vending machine, you press the Coke button. Well, the movement you're making, of course, is recorded as an accelerometer trace. The timing of somebody pressing the button, those two are compared. Now you get more security with an explicit verification. So you're signing something. That is a lot of movement for the accelerometer. The terminal that you're signing on not only records a click, but it records the motion. Or if you're holding a stylus as you're signing, that can record an accelerometer trace. And those two accelerometer traces can be compared. So it's a user action, of course. It's something you have to do. Most people don't like to sign, but they would be willing to sign if it's for a TV or for several hundred dollars of grocery. If it's for a can of soda, it's a click, and that's enough. Now, let me talk about a couple of attacks that are possible and why they're not concerns. So the first attack is that your uh, kids or your spouse or your cleaner, yes? Uh, good point. I, I was just waiting for somebody to, to realize that. Yeah, I'm kind of short in this talk because I don't uh, cover all the details. The fact that you're wearing your watch, if you're right-handed on your left, but you're signing on your right, that is a problem. And so when we're saying smartwatch, that would not exactly and by necessity have that feature, but a bracelet would. So a smart bracelet would have that feature. You could also have multi-device uh, configurations where your watch is where the clasp is, but the accelerometer is on a ring you're wearing on your right hand. 
So, so there are configurations to deal with it, but, but thanks for pointing it out. I thought I would get away with it, but I, I should have known better. So let me talk about the, uh, this uh, first attack. Somebody opens your drawer and, and takes out your, uh, your device and puts it on in order to be you. Now that doesn't work because the device in the drawer doesn't have your identity. It's been opened after all. You took it off in order to put it there. It doesn't matter who puts it on. It either will refuse to have an identity or it will only agree to have their identity. Or of course, they will need your password or your biometrics or your PIN. So it isn't stronger than the underlying authentication measure that is used to authenticate to it. But at least that one cannot be uh, attacked online. You have to have physical access in order to do this. Another problem is you're walking around in town and somebody comes and tears the watch off of you in order to be you, to go and buy a TV or whatever. You don't want that to happen. Now that's also easily prevented. The, um, the band here could have a small connector. If the connector is torn, then the circuit is open. And therefore, just like if you're opening the clasp, you're breaking the circuit. And therefore, that is not an approach. Now, one thing that might concern people is, you know, am I going to be held up and somebody's going to take my arm, take my hand in order to slide off the watch? That would be a gruesome way of having your identity stolen. You don't want that to be possible. So you want kind of an exit mechanism by which, under duress, you can give somebody the ability to authenticate as you without you being in trouble. And there are a couple of ways of doing that. The most obvious one is you take it off, you put it on them, and you authenticate as you. Another way is that physically you could have a way of detaching it in order not to break the circuit. But that's not something you would do every day. It's only under duress you would do that. So this is a proposal that shows that you could get better authentication simply by this tethering physical and, and logical together and looking at the special cases of how to do it. Um, there are lots more detail in the paper, which I uh, ask you to take a look at if you're interested. And I'm also open to questions if you have any. Yes? Yes. Let me, let me repeat the question. Uh, the, uh, the question was relating to NUMI. NUMI is um, a device that determines uh, your identity. Now, one big difference is that the approach that I'm describing here asks to acquire an identity once and for all when you put it on. And that lowers the cost of the sensor or whatever way you have to do it. And it also increases the security because you can have a pretty um, rough verification of identity. It only happens once a day. Um, whereas NIMI is doing continuous verification of the identity. Um, that could be done in many ways. Um, I believe NIMI is using some biometrics. That means that, um, for example, the skin under your watch is being verified if it corresponds to you. That corresponds to a risk of false negatives and false positives, of course, which are traded off. If the watch slides a little bit, it's not going to look necessarily like you. Um, and it uh, puts larger constraint on the device and the cost of making the device. So in order to escape that problem, um, the approach that I, I was describing says you authenticate once and for all. And you don't have to rely on biometrics, but you could rely on whatever technology you like to authenticate. And then you keep the identity. But that's a good point. Yes, Marcus, um, if I can just explain a little bit more, I think Nabi and this can coexist. The Nabi protocol and this, uh, this uh, bracelet can coexist. Because really what the Nabi protocol is is a wire format to create a crypto assertion for the cloud. And um, imagine that the Nabi was built into this bracelet. So as long as you have the bracelet on and you've authenticated to it somehow once a day, you can then go about your business and you can create these crypto assertions to hand out when you're signing in or when you're purchasing something. So I, th I think they can coexist and I, I don't see them being like uh, okay. different in, in any way. So. They're closely related. Yeah. They're not the same though. And um, so I uh, encourage you to look at 
both the proposal in the white paper and also at what NIM is doing. Um, they have similarities but also notable differences which I think are beneficial to understand and address. I think we have question. one more question if anybody has it. Yes. Right. So the question is, what if I take a smartwatch and I close it like this and now authenticate to it? Um, that would be undesirable. The person could carry it around in the pocket and not realizing that this has happened. You know, It might seem convenient at first, but it's undesirable later. And yes, you could do that. You could very easily have a sensor that determines l some form of liveness, um, whether this is being worn, in other words. So that is a good point, and, and that is something that is considered as well. So with that, thank you very much. And if you have further questions, please see me after. Thank you.